privilege to be here. We're thankful, God, that uh, we're your children. And Father, we can pray. We can ask. Uh, God, so many times we have not just because we ask not. So I pray, Lord, this morning that you'd bless our assembly and bless these folk that have come, Father, to assemble as uh, believers to or be exhorted, Father, in this age. And God, so much the more as we see the coming of the Son of God, Lord, to this earth, Father, for the rapture of the church. And God, I pray that you'd just build people here today. Father, you exhort, you rebuke, you edify, you do whatever is needed. God, you're in the need supplying business. Father, I confess I am in need today, so I trust, Father, that you take and uh, uh, fulfill the reason you even have for us meeting here today. We're thankful for our church, whereby uh, we're not here to pretend or perform before anyone. We're not here to take and... Uh, uh, show off. We're here to please Thee. And God, I pray now Your name will be honored, glorified, lifted up in this congregation. Bless Brother uh, Fuller now in this hour. We're glad that he showed up. And Father, we're glad that, uh, that You've worked it out where he could be with us this morning. Father, I ask that You'd use him, use his life, his ministry. Father, I pray in some way that You'd open doors before him, uh, supply his need, uh, prepare his path. And God, I'm thankful this is a day now that You've made we can rejoice be glad in it. In your name we pray, in your name we ask it. Amen. Amen. All right, brother. You got her? <laughs> all right, that's without notice at all. Amen. That's in a real hurry. Amen. Maybe you got a revival. Brother Wayne wants me to try to stop it. Didn't know what to do with it. I, I believe I can get it stopped. I can get it shut down. Amen. Good to see you. Good to be here. Before we get our lesson this morning, John chapter 16. Let me say just a little bit about the mission. I'm glad I got to come. Uh, recently, I don't know if Brother Homer this week's told you about it or not. Probably has, but recently, him and I went down to Trinidad together and spent a few days down there looking at the field of Trinidad and so on. There's been a lot of things happen uh, in Trinidad, and as a result of some things that's happened on the field, uh, the field of Trinidad, I believe, I can be honest in saying, is closed to scriptural independent Baptist missions. And uh, as a result of that, it looks like I'm not going to be going to Trinidad. And let me tell you what I will be doing. You can pray for me. Uh, in September, Dr. Richard Sandlin, Tri-County Baptist Temple in Painesville, Ohio, and I together will begin a Bible Institute four nights a week. And I'm going to teach four nights a week in the Institute. And then on Wednesdays and weekends, I'm going to have free. And I'll stay with Evangelism Missions Incorporated and probably... Uh, be in some mission conferences with Brother Homer and do all I can on those nights to promote missions and speak in the mission conferences and so on. And uh, the field of Trinidad, as far as being closed, I said is closed to scriptural independent Baptist missions. In order to go to Trinidad, uh, you have to go through an organization that uh, uh, tells you where to go on the island, what to do in the churches, owns the churches, in fact, that are established through that organization. And uh, I think you can get into Trinidad, but in getting in, you have to go through that organization, join that organization, and when you get there, they tell you everything to do. Of course, you can't operate like that. And so make that a real matter of prayer. I know some men that have went through the organization, but as far as I know, they're not doing anything. In fact, they're not even there now. Maybe, maybe one's left, but uh, the churches they established belong to the organization. In fact, the churches don't even ordain their own preachers. The organization or, uh, ordains their preachers and so on. And so that's what's happened, but uh, that doesn't mean that I'm not going to be involved in missions. I'm going to do all I can to promote missions, work in missions, and speak in mission conferences, and uh, anything I can do for EMI, the mission board's a good mission board, anything I can do for them, and any influence that I can have to promote that board, I'll do it. So you pray for me, and uh, then something else that I'm really concerned about is the quality of men that mission boards are sending the mission field. I'm really concerned about that. And uh, I don't know how you feel about the schools around the country, but I don't know of one major school that's training fundamental Bible-believing missionaries to do a job when they go to the field. Now, I really know uh, schools are pumping fellows up to get out and build the biggest church in town, and evangelism, 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 but we're not instilling in, in preacher boys conviction and character and faith in the Word of God and just go out and do what has to be done and just, I mean, face the world and do it. And uh, I trust and pray that uh, we can have the kind of Bible Institute in northern Ohio that'll uh, teach men to, to just go out and do it, go out and do the job. And, you know, Dr. Sandler and I were talking about the big league-leading soul winners of the day and the schools that they operate uh, and the preacher boys that they turn out, they encourage them to go to the big metropolitan areas of the country and uh, go to cities of 100,000 people or more. 
and build churches in those areas. What about those little uh, towns, 5, 10, 15, 20,000? Uh, they need churches too, you know. And uh, the size works, not going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. The sort work that it is, see. And we don't teach faithfulness any longer. We teach just uh, success. And you don't have to be big to be successful, uh, be faithful to be successful. And so uh, we're going to attempt by the grace of God to train some men uh, in the Word of God that will go out and stand true to the book and do a work for the Lord Jesus Christ. So you pray for me as uh, I change directions. All right. In John chapter 16, if you take your Bible uh, and open it to John chapter 16, we'll read verse 7 through 15. John chapter 16, verse 7 through 15. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. Now there's a danger in Christianity today of being driven the opposite direction by somebody that's off doctrinally. And uh, the charismatics, for one thing, have driven fundamental Baptists the wrong direction on the work of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, I praise the Lord for Brother Homer. He hadn't let anybody affect him. Uh, he shout and be straight too, amen. And I think you can do that. I think you can have a good, chi a good time and rejoice in the Lord and praise God and uh, yet uh, uh, not be off doctrinally. I think you can. I think I said here once before that a right head give you a warm heart, and it will. You know, if you're doctrinally straight, then you got something to shout about. I never in my life heard a liberal say, praise the Lord, Jesus wasn't virgin born, did you? I never saw anybody shouting because the church was going through the tribulation. I never heard anybody holler, glory to God, amen, hallelujah, you can lose your salvation, never in my life. But uh, if you're doctrinally shut to straight, then you got a reason to shout. Now, because of the charismatics and some of the assemblies of God, churches of God, those type churches, uh, uh, being off doctrinally, then when they shout and they have a good time, then we go the other way and dry up, you know, and don't do anything. But uh, the work of the Holy Spirit's real, and uh, he's here. He's yeah. the greatest person on the earth today. Yeah. And I even think that because of some of those that get uh, off doctrinally and then express some emotionalism, that we've failed to study about the office work of the Holy Spirit, the personality of the Holy Spirit. And I think it's a neglected subject. And I think we need to know where we stand on the work of the Holy Spirit. And I want to look at some things this morning uh, just here in John chapter 16 concerning the Holy Spirit. Now, first of all, he's a personality. If you'll notice in verse uh, 7, uh, Jesus said, I will send him unto you. Verse 8, he is come. Uh, he will reprove the world of sin and so on. Down in verse 13, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. And 13 times in the verses that we've read, it's called he, his, or him. It's personified. And the Holy Spirit is a person, just as real as the Father's a person. And just as real as the Son's a person, the Holy Spirit's a person. Now, sometimes we try to uh, illustrate the Trinity, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And uh, because we don't understand the uh, deity of the Holy Spirit, the deity of the Son, the deity of the Father, then we have a hard, hard time illustrating uh, the Godhead. Now, here's the way it is. Sometimes you'll see somebody draw, draw a diagram, and they say it's the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, and they do it like a triangle, but that's not the way it is. If that's the way it was, then you'd have a three-sided God. You'd have three gods. And that's not the way it is. But here's the way it is. You've got one God. Now, that God is manifest in the Father, and is manifest in the Son, and is manifest in the Holy Ghost. Now, the Holy Ghost is God, and the Son is God, and the Father's God. Now, the Father's not the Son, and the Son's not the Father, and the Father's not the Holy Ghost. But together, they make up God. And so when I say God, I'm talking about in general terms of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, they're all three God, and those three make up one Godhead. Now, that's the way the Godhead is. And the Holy Ghost is just as much God as the Father, just as much God as the Son. And uh, I used to use the phrase, the third person of the Trinity, referring to the Holy Spirit. That's not right. He's not the third person of the Trinity. I heard Dr. Harold Seidler say one time that he's not the third person of the Trinity. 
And I sat up straight in my seat right then. I thought, well, what's he going to say about that? And when I sat up, he simply explained it. He said, he's not number three, he's number one. And when you list them one, two, and three, you have a tendency to make one inferior to the other. But one's not inferior to the other. One's not superior to the other. They're all on equal ground. It's the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And so they're all three number one. Now let's look at some verses today concerning the personality of the Holy Spirit. Look over in Acts chapter 15, if you will. And in Acts chapter 15, there's a phrase there concerning the Holy Spirit that implies personality. Implies he's a person. In Acts chapter 15 and verse 28. In Acts 15, 28, the Bible says, For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. It seemed good to the Holy Ghost. Now, isn't that strange? That could not be said about an influence or a power or a force. That's said about a personality. It seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. It said the Holy Ghost and we together uh, were agreed on that. Look in John chapter 16 again uh, and verse 14, John 16, 14. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. And so in Acts 15, he's mentioned in connection with Christians. In John 16, 14, he's mentioned in connection with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in uh, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, if you look back there, Matthew 28, 19. In Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So in... Acts chapter 15, he's mentioned in connection with Christians. In John 16, he's mentioned in connection with Christ. In Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, he's mentioned in connection with the Trinity. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Now, we don't have any trouble believing that the uh, Christian is a person. And we don't have any problem believing that the Lord Jesus Christ is a person. And we don't have any uh, problem believing that the Father is a person. And he connects the Holy Spirit with all of those in those verses that I've read. And then again in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, turn over there and you get another verse dealing with the personality of the Holy Spirit. Second Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14. Second Corinthians thirteen fourteen, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. And so again, he connects him to the Father and the Son uh, in a phrase that ties him to personality. Look at one more in Jude verse 20 and 21. Jude verse 20. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And so over and over and over, the Bible takes the Holy Spirit and connects him with people and gives a characteristic to him that's only proper of a personality. And so just in view of those verses, you've got to say that he's a person. Now, let me give you something else real quick, and you can check the verses on these later if you wish. But the Holy Spirit does things that only can be said of a personality. In other words, he performs acts that are proper to a personality. For instance, he searches, he knows, he speaks, he testifies, he reveals, he convinces, he commands, he strives, he moves, he helps, he guides, he creates, he sanctifies, he inspires, he makes intercession, he orders the affairs of the church, he performs miracles, and he raises the dead. Now, those things can only be said of the Holy Spirit. And then he's affected as a person by the acts of others as a person. For instance, he's resisted, he's grieved, he's vexed, he's blasphemed. And that can only be said about a person. Uh, he suffers as a person. Uh, look over in the book of Matthew, if you would, chapter 12. 
I'm going to take the time to teach this morning. I'm going to leave the shouting to Brother Homer. Amen. <laughs> now, the miracles, without going to the verses this morning, the miracles that the Lord Jesus Christ performed, he performed in the power of the Holy Spirit, right? Now, that's evident. That's obvious. All right, in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 24, It says, when the Pharisees heard it, the miracle that he performed in verse 22. In verse 22, then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb. And he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And verse 24, when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. Now, what they say? They said, the power through which he did that is the power of the devil. And the power through which he did that was the Holy Spirit. They, all right. They accused the Holy Spirit of being the power of the devil. They spoke blasphemously against the Holy Spirit. They said the power through which you did that is the power of the devil. Well, it was the power of the Holy Spirit through which he did it. And so they presumed that. That was a presumption. They knew not where they, whereof they spake. And they presumed that that was the power of the devil through which he spoke. And so that just leads me to say from that verse that he's blasphemed by the presumption of men. You know, you ought to be careful what you say. And there's no premium on ignorance. And sometimes you may criticize the act of somebody just because that that doesn't suit your personality. But what they do and what they say may be scripturally right. And if what they do and what they say scripturally right and you criticize that just through presumption, you may be guilty of doing the same thing these folks did. So, I mean, somebody may be working under the power of God and be working and performing spiritually and scripturally, and just because that you're not used to it and you don't like it and it doesn't suit you, uh, you criticize it like these folks criticize the Lord Jesus for what he did, and they blasphemed the Holy Spirit too, by, just by presumption. And so he's blasphemed by presumption. And then something else, in Hebrews chapter 10... There's a verse there concerning the Holy Spirit. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 29. It says, Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the spirit of grace. What's it mean when you've done despite under the spirit of grace? Well, you've insulted him. That's an insult. How do you do that? Who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. And we have a saying that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ either on your heart or your feet. And you're going through it one way or another before you die. And you'll either trod underfoot the Son of God and count the blood of the covenant an unholy thing, or you'll accept it and be washed in it and saved by the grace of God. And so that leads me to say that every person who dies without the Lord Jesus Christ, the blood on their feet, have rejected the invitation of the Holy Spirit somewhere in life and have been an insult to Him. Now how in the world can that work? Well, you just suppose with me that the Creator, and uh, Job said, by His Spirit He hath made me. And so the Holy Ghost was active in the creation. And you just suppose that the Creator comes to His own creation and knocks at His heart's door for an entrance, and He says, no, you can't come in. Well, that's an insult, isn't it? I mean, the Holy Spirit brings the gospel of Jesus Christ to an unsaved person and says He shed His blood for you, He died for you, uh, you can be saved, you need to be saved, you need to be born again, the blood can wash away your sins, and he pleads, and he entreatingly calls for a sinner to come to the Lord Jesus Christ, and they push him aside. You know why? They're not willing to humble themselves and trust the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's insulted by the pride of men. So he's blasphemed by the presumption of men, he's insulted by the pride of men. And then in Isaiah chapter 63 and verse 10 is a verse on something else that happens. Concerning the Holy Spirit. Isaiah chapter 63 and verse 10. It 
It says, but they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. I can think of a real practical, practical illustration to, to reveal the truth of that verse. But just let me say the point is that he's vexed by the rebellion of men. Uh, you know, we sometimes get to looking at God as being holy and he is, and God is great and he is, and uh, we're finite and he's infinite, and that's true. And uh, God can do anything that he chooses to do, and that's true. And God could come down here and overpower the sinner and save him by his grace if he chose to do, that's true. He could do that. God could do anything that he chooses to do. But, you know, sometimes in looking at God like that, you fail to see the personality that's involved. Vexed by the rebellion of men. Does God ever get upset? If the Holy Ghost is God, he does. Does God ever get disappointed? If the Holy Ghost is God, he does. Does he ever get aggravated? If the Holy Ghost is God, he does. It says that he's vexed by the rebellion of men. Now suppose that I take one of my children, take my boy, and he's done something wrong. He's done something disobedient. He's been disobedient. And I say, now son, you've got to be punished for that. And I'm not uh, really aggravated. I'm not uh, vexed with him. I'm not disturbed, really. He's done that, and I know the right thing to do is to discipline him. And so Tim and I go to the heavenly woodshed. We'll go back to the bedroom or somewhere, and I say, now it's uh, time, son, for you to get your discipline, and I'll discipline him, you know. And did you know what? Uh, if after I discipline him, we pray together, and I say, now, son, I love you, and I had to do that. He will cry and say, I love you too, Daddy. And uh, we go out of there with a sweet spirit then I feel good and he feels good. But listen, you know what? If I take one of my children, which they don't do this, I usually do a good enough job the first time not any problem, have any problem about it. But if I take one of my children and I discipline them, now when I discipline them and I corrected them, and uh, after it's over with, boy, they puff up and go stomping out of the house and slam the door behind them, you know? Boy, that aggravates me. That just vexes me to no end. You? Sure. That rebellious spirit vexes me. And you know what I do? I said, boy, I'll teach you. You know what happens? We go to war and I become his enemy. Amen. Yeah, well, that's what the verse said in Isaiah 43 10, wasn't it? Therefore, God said he's turned against them and become their enemy. And so the Holy Spirit is vexed by the rebellion of men. Now, when the Holy Spirit comes and reproves you for something, if you just break down and get all humble and mushy and go to weeping and a crying and fall at his feet and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know what he'll do? He'll put his arm around you and pull you up to himself and love you. So I'm proud of you. You know? Sure he will. Yeah. But you run off and get mad at God and see what happens. You rebel. And that rebellious spirit vexes the Holy Spirit. And by the way, you know what the sin unto death that a Christian can, can commit is? Somebody said it's fornication. Well, I could say if you say it's fornication, I could say it's lying. You know? God kills some folks for lying. And there's a number of things in the Bible that God kills some folks for. Well, what is the sin that the Holy Spirit can kill a saved person for? It's rebellion. That's what it is. Did you know we take our judicial system from the Bible? And it doesn't matter what the crime that a criminal has committed is. It may have been breaking and entering, or it may have been murder, you know. It may have been any number of crimes, but the thing that the officer can kill him for is resisting arrest. It's rebellion, see. And so when the officer comes and says, halt, I mean, he robbed a store, and he doesn't halt, and he says, halt, he doesn't halt, and he says, halt, he doesn't halt, then legally he can shoot him in his tracks, right? He can kill him for rebelling and resisting arrest, see? And I don't think that there's any sin that a Christian can commit that God won't forgive him for. He'll forgive him for any sin that he commits if he'll confess that sin, a scriptural confession. But when he rebels against it, it may have been fornication, it may have been adultery, it may have been lying. It could have been any number of things. But when he rebels, he vexes his Holy Spirit through that rebellion. And God can scripturally kill him for not submitting, you see. And so he's vexed by the rebellion of men. And then something else in Acts chapter 7, very familiar passage. And verse 51, Acts seven fifty-one. And Stephen says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. And that's unbelief. He's resisted by unbelief. And you know, there's 
uh, a point in the five points of Calvinism, T-U-L-I-P-I is irresistible grace. And uh, you can't separate the grace of God from the work of the Holy Ghost. No way in the world. It's of the grace of God that he's here. We don't merit the Holy Spirit. It's of the grace of God that he goes down this aisle between these pews and Brother Homer preaches and, and deals with the hearts of men. You can't separate the Holy Ghost from the grace of God. And irresistible grace, this is the only verse you need to prove, disprove that. It said, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. And the sin that they committed was unbelief. They didn't believe the preaching of Stephen. And through unbelief, they resisted the Holy Ghost. Therefore, they resisted the grace of God. See? And so as a person, every time that somebody disbelieves or refuses to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, they resist the Holy Ghost, resist the grace of God. And every sinner that goes to hell goes resisting the grace of God. Every one of them. And so he's resisted by unbelief. And then in Acts chapter 5, turn over there if you will, and boy, I hope God don't start doing this again. What he done in Acts chapter 5. God started killing everybody that lied. Brother Homer, you preached to a thin crowd this morning. I don't know. You might not be here. I don't know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but if God started killing everybody that ever lied after they got saved, yeah, I'd have been in heaven a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. How about you? Let me, let me ask you a question this morning. How many of you used to... Uh, before you got saved, you used to drink a lot. You got saved, you don't drink at all now. Amen, that's pretty good. All right. How many of you, before you got saved, you used to cuss a lot, and you don't cuss at all now? Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, so I said that a little quick, didn't I? <laughs> How many of you got saved, before you got saved, you used to go to the movies, you don't go to the movies now? Amen, that's pretty good. All right. How many of you, before you got saved, you used to go parties and dancing, you got saved, and you don't do that now? Amen, that's pretty good. How many before you got saved, you lied a lot, you got saved, and you still do a little bit? <laughs> yeah, amen. Appreciate your honesty. <laughs> amen. I, folks, uh, if I told you that I hadn't lied since I got saved and God started killing folks for lying, he'd kill me then, amen. Yes, sir. He flat killed those folks in Acts chapter 5 for lying. And the uh, beginning verse 1 of Acts chapter 5, but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphire, his wife sold a possession, kept back part of the price, his wife also being private to it, brought a certain part, laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? I notice that. To lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land. Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Now there's a verse to prove the deity of the Holy Ghost. It said you lied to the Holy Ghost, and then it said you lied to God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Notice that tempt. Isn't that something? Tempt. The Spirit. Can he be tempted? He sure can. And in that situation, he gave in. Amen. <laughs> yeah, he couldn't resist it. What tempted him? Their dishonesty. Well, you better be careful. I've got an idea that there's a lot of folks today that through their dishonesty have come that close to getting killed. I mean, the Holy Ghost probably looked over that and thought, I'd just wipe him out. And if he'd had somebody like the Apostle Peter around to agon, on, he probably would. Amen. Yeah. Amen. It said he was tempted, and it was their dishonesty that tempted him. See? And I bet there's been a lot of times that some saved folks, Brother Wayne, or they just got that close, and the Holy Spirit said, boy, one more step. I'm going to wind you up. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> yes, sir. Tempted by dishonesty. Now that can only be said about a personality. Sure. Well, he's tempted by dishonesty. And then in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, something else about the Holy Spirit. That kind of makes me shudder to wonder how close I've been to going on a time or two, you know. Get a little shady something, something just wasn't right, my heart wasn't right, and get to grumbling about something, the Holy Spirit probably looked out and said, Boy, you you getting close. You better be careful. Wipe you out, take you to heaven a little prematurely. First Thessalonians chapter five and verse nineteen. 
quench not the spirit. Now that's a good one. Well, how do you quench the spirit? How do you do that? Well, to quench means that you subdue or you bind or you limit the Holy Spirit. See? All right, how can you limit? How can you bind? How can you suppress or subdue the Holy Spirit? I think you can do that preaching sometimes. I think I can do that. Sure can. Did you know if you suppress or bind or limit the Holy Spirit, that means that he's not working with full ability. That means he's not doing everything that he could do. And uh, when I get up to preach, the Holy Spirit won't bless my sincerity. The Holy Spirit will bless the truth. Now, you can mark that down. He'll bless the truth. Then if I want the Holy Spirit to bless the message I preach, I've got to preach the truth. See? And if I don't preach the truth, if I don't preach what the Word of God says, then I've quenched the Holy Spirit. Now, it may sound good to me, and I may like it, but my own ways, not God's ways, quench the Holy Spirit. Now, I think I ought to like God's ways. And I do. I love the Word of God, and uh, I love the truth. But, uh, you know, you can get off base of the Scriptures and get to doing it the way you want to do it. And you've quenched the Holy Spirit, and he never promised to bless our ways. And that's not only concerning preaching, but anything that you choose to do. If you want to do it your way, the Holy Spirit won't bless you. You do it God's way. And so he's quenched by our own ways. All right? Let's look at uh, one more under that heading in Ephesians chapter 4. And let me say concerning this passage that I praise the Lord for Mount Hope Baptist Church and, and I'm sure that Brother Homer now that he's been here a week would probably agree with me unless you had a fight recently <laughs> and I don't think you have but the spirit of unity there's good spirit of unity here real good I mean excellent and I appreciate that and that's one of the things that has to be in order for the Holy Spirit to bless in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30 The Bible says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. So it says, Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. He can be grieved. Well, how do you grieve the Holy Spirit? Look at verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Now, in the context, the Holy Spirit is grieved when a person is bitter, wrathful, has anger, clamor, and the things in that context. And so discord among brethren, that's what it is. Discord among the brethren grieve the Holy Spirit. It grieves the Holy Spirit. And without realizing it consciously, subconsciously, it, it, this is what happens. And I've got to get off from it a, uh, a few days and look back to see what happened. But I can get in a church, and uh, there can be a conflict in that church over something that I'm not aware of, and there's not a good spirit there. And I can preach three or four days or maybe a week, and when I leave, I find that my spirit's been torn down. And I don't leave there as, as jubilant and as victorious as I was when I came. And I may not know what caused that for some time later. But then I can look back and I can see that there's been a grievous spirit there because of conflict and discord among the brethren. But you can get to church where there's good unity and, boy, it's refreshing. I mean, you just get in there and preach and, and you leave revived yourself. And so he's grieved by discord among the brethren. All right. That's some things to indicate the personality of the Holy Spirit. He's affected as a personality by the actions of others and so on. But uh, concerning the work of the Holy Spirit, what's he do? Does the Holy Spirit work? And is he active? Does he do things? Just let me give you some things real quick that he does, and then maybe the last point before we close, uh, we'll turn to the verses. But I'll just quote the verses and read some that I've got written down here. But the work of the Holy Spirit involves striving. Genesis 6, 3, The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in 120 years. Now, I think God said in that verse, he said it's going to be 120 years from now until the time of the flood. Now, that's how long it's going to be. And said, my spirit 
shall not always strive with man, yet his days shall be 120 years. I believe God's saying 120 years, I'm going to give him, that the Holy Spirit's going to work with man. And I believe he did. Right up to the time that Noah closed that ark, I believe the Holy Spirit worked with man. But God said that'll not always be. He said he'll not always strive with man. And in the context, he's talking about that period of time and that dispensation. God's simply saying it's going to be 120 years of striving before I send the blood. See? I don't think God meant at all that that would be the last days that the Holy Spirit would ever strive with man. Not at all, because he still does. I believe today the Holy Spirit will strive. You know, if he didn't, if the Holy Spirit didn't strive, I'll tell you what would happen. Uh, Brother Homer would get up here and preach uh, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He'd been an unsaved person sitting back there, and maybe you're there this morning. And Brother Homer would get up here and preach, and the Holy Spirit would take the message to you, say, Jesus died for you shed his blood for you, you need to be saved. And you'd say, no, not today. He'd say, all right, walk off, Holy Spirit never deal again. But he doesn't do that, he strives, doesn't he? Amen. He'll bring the message down there, Amen. and he'll give you the message, and he'll deal with your heart, and you say no. And the Holy Spirit will go off, let you go a day or two, and he'll come back again, and he'll give that message again. And he'll invite you to the Lord Jesus Christ. You say no. And uh, he may go away 15 minutes later. He come back again. And he comes back, 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 and he just keeps coming back. You know what? He's striving with you. See? Your old nature said no, and he said you better. And your nature said no, and he said God loves you. And your nature said no, and he said Jesus died for you. And you say no, and he says that preacher told you the truth. And he strives with you, right? See, that's one of the works of the Holy Spirit is to strive. And that's another reason why we preach the truth is unless he strives, no, sir, you won't come. No, sir. You know what the Holy Spirit does? I saw an illustration the other day. Boy, I liked it. I mean, about the best I saw. But I tell you what the Holy Spirit will do. He strives with you, but he doesn't drag you. Doesn't drag you. And a fellow told me not long ago, said he went over to a farm, said he's over to the farm, and some of you folks know about this, and said he went out there and opened a gate where he was going to put some cattle through. And he said, you know what? He said, we can get around here and try to drive those cattle through there. And he said, try to hit them and gouge them and so on. He said, you can do it if you got enough help. But he said, they'll try to run and go back through and so on. But he said, you know what? He said, let's go get a cup of coffee. And he said, and we come back, said, every one of those cattle will have wandered right on through that. So they'll just wander right on through that gate. And that's the way they work, isn't it? And he said, you know, if they don't, he said, show you how to do it. And said, he come out there and said, there's one, you know, off out there. And he just kind of got out there around it, you know, just a few little moves like that. And just, you know, didn't excite it too much. Just kind of, you know, took his time and, and, and run that old cow right on through there. And you know what the Holy Spirit does? I tell you, what do you do? He'll find a stray out there sometimes. So That's one of his works, is to strive. Boy, that's great. You get in a service somewhere, and there's lost people there, and the Word of God's preached, and you can just sense the Holy Spirit down to strive in their hearts. Isn't that something? Yes, sir. Well, the Holy Spirit strives. Not only does he strive, he reproves. Our text, John 16, verse 8, And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now, there's a difference in a reproof and a rebuke. A rebuke says, Bless God, you wrong. Amen. You didn't have any business doing that, Brother Wayne. And that's sin, boy. Now that's a review. You don't know want to reprove this. The so reproof is Brother Wayne. So you dirty, rotten, filthy sinner, you, you're going to hell. And you ought to go to hell. You know that. Uh, he doesn't do that. The Word of God's preached. One of the most loving, gentle, and treating experiences that you'll ever have is when the Holy Spirit reveals the love of God to you and draws you to the Lord Jesus Christ. And did you know what constrains us? The love of Christ constraineth us. 
and he reproves. Uh, John 6, 63, it's the spirit that quickeneth. He quickens, and that's him that does it. It's the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they're spirit, and they're life, and so he quickens. And then in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that you believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And so he seals. And then Romans chapter 8 and verse 16, the Spirit itself, and don't get alarmed, that itself. That doesn't take away from the personality at all. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And so he witnesses. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27, likewise, the Spirit also himself. Uh, helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And so he intercedes. Acts chapter 13 and verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. He calls. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. He ordains. He made them overseers of the flock. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say come. He invites. Romans chapter 8 and verse 14. For as many as are led by the spirit of God. They are the sons of God. He leads. John chapter 14 verse 16. And I will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter. He comforts. And then he reveals. What does he reveal? Romans 5, 5, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. He reveals the love of God. He reveals the things of Christ. John 16, 14, He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and show it unto you. He reveals the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Let me give you the references now. Time's up. He reveals the way into truth, John 16, 13. He reveals the path of service in Acts chapter 8 and verse 29, the Holy Spirit. And uh, I think the need of the hour is for folks to be full of the Holy Ghost. Amen. All right, time's up. Thank you, Brother Wayne. Amen.